in welcoming a celebrated cook, uh, a course, a writer, and an entrepreneur. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Thomasina Myers OBE. Thomasina. What a delicious lunch. Uh, that is a very good way to show how food can be woven into everything you do. Um, and also I thought of just reflecting on slowness, uh, speed versus efficiency. Uh, Lisa, who very kindly invited me to speak today, at one point said, gosh, you've got quite a packed schedule. Would you like to fly to Glasgow from London? And I was like, no, I do not want to fly. I want to sit on a lovely slow train, actually speedy train, and get lots of work done, time to reflect and read. Uh, and I definitely don't want the false economy of efficiency, which I think so many of us embrace uh, these days. Um, so I'm going to be here and talking about food systems. By the way, I voted for food too as a lagger. It's a definite lagger. And it's also connected to everything. Um, and how, how can we harness the potential? I thought we could start by just looking at what food is. Um, and I've highlighted the word nutritional because I think that's the key word we always forget when we talk about food. It's supposed to give us nutrition. And actually, if you look at most of the food that are sold in shops and supermarkets these days, a lot of them have added nutrition to them. The moment it says added vitamins, added niacin, added iron, you know that they've only added them because fundamentally at the building stage, those vitamins or minerals haven't been there. So it's an immediate red flag of why am I eating this if it's had to add food in those nutritions back to it. Um, so the current state of play, I think the backdrop of this is the Green Revolution, where for many good reasons, we decided we had to um, affect our food productivity. We were an island nation, we were starving to death after the Second World War. We had to make more food and be more self-sufficient. So that was you know, done for all the right reasons. But uh, we've seen the consequences now to what the impact of that. Um, and in terms of climate and diverse biodiversity, the food sector is responsible for a third of greenhouse gas emissions, between 30 and 33 percent. It, kind of, it's a mute point. So it's a massive driver of carbon. Um, it's a massive user of fresh water. 74 percent of our fresh water is used in food production. Um, and um, if you look at countries really close to home now, Spain and Italy recently, where we know that the size of our tomatoes and lettuces that we like to eat are going to be severely, like, materially impacted by their drought this year, uh, that is really in stark relief at the moment. Uh, biodiversity, the biggest driver of biodiversity loss is our food production system. And I think biodiversity is one of those kind of slightly esoteric words where people slightly goes over their heads because you know what's it mean but you know really if we think about the bumblebee you know, in places like in farms in china now they are having to hand pollinate crops because of the bee decimation to their populations the earthworm and the dung beetle merlin sheldrake's book entangled life and many others have shown us how important worms dung beetles invertebrates are to the futures of our soils with 95% of our food is still grown in soil, so we degrade our soil at huge risk. Um, our waterways, the pollution of our waterways, a lot of it's blamed on the big water companies, quite rightly so, but a lot of that is also farm effluent, uh, the huge kind of factory chicken farms uh, lining the River Wye. We're still opening factory farms in, this in, in the UK, which is extraordinary. You cannot even swim in the River Wye. I mean, isn't that extraordinary that on our watch we can no longer swim in our most pretty rivers? Um, soil degradation. I went to Easter Island in my 20s and learnt how the population basically just died out. Um, some people think it's because there were also um, infected rats that came off a ship, but essentially they chopped down all their trees. Uh, a decade later, I was lucky enough to go to Palenque and taken round by the chief archaeologist um, of the site, who said that down soil, soil, uh, so carbon analysis of the soil had shown that the Mayans, who ruled for a thousand years, the most powerful people, um, had suddenly become desolate, you know, died out over a very short time period. And that was down to, again, soil degradation. There's a population explosion, and they cut down all their trees to grow all their pyramids and do this kind of intensive uh, agriculture. So that's a sort of salutary lesson. On one side, a tiny island, then rather a large peoples, ruling rather large part of the Americas, and we're doing that on a global scale right now. 
Um, and then monoculture. Uh, we have this obsession with monoculture, and it's driven by high yields, um, but it comes at many costs. And of course, you talk about diversity of crops as well. And if we only permit and, and promote monoculture, we are doing away with all the wild varieties. And we're seeing that increasingly in the world of vanilla, cacao, coffee beans, bananas, where increasingly the wild varieties are becoming increasingly extinct. And without those wild varieties, we have no safety net to catch us when the, um, when the varieties we are cultivating are killed by plague or, or disease. Um, that is a picture of a UFO, which I thought was, it amused me, because I think five years ago, when we said UPF, no one knew what we talked about. Um, and now I feel like it's everywhere, and there's an amazing new book that's just come out called um, Ultra Processed People by Chris Van Tulliken that is a really good, focused look at what UPFs are. They make up 70, uh, they make up 57% of our basket in this country, in this so nation. So um, we have the worst diet in Europe, which is great. Um, uh, if you if you um, if you don't know what an ultra processed food is, typically it's wrapped in plastic. Uh, it's got a emulsifier in it. It's probably got a sweetener inside it. Uh, it lasts on a shelf for a long time, which makes it really profitable. Um, and it will definitely have a couple of ingredients that you won't have lurking in your cupboard, I hope. Um, uh, it, it's made from monocrop, so it's largely made from the four main mo monocrops that, um, that are responsible for 60% of the calories we eat. Um, these monocrops are chemically formed because the only way they can be formed is with chemicals, and increasingly they need more chemicals um, as um, diseases and insects become resistant to those chemicals. Um, uh, they have absolutely no fibre in them. Fibre is really good for two reasons. It tells us when we're full, so that lunch was delicious and I feel actually quite full now. If there's no fibre in that food, I'd probably still be wanting to eat more and still kind of reaching for more of those delicious baklavas. It's also really good for our gut bacteria. It helps our whole system. It feeds those good gut bacteria. So it's really important, fibre. And then there are all the health risks, that, um, which I'll talk about in a second. This is a really, I love this label. I got sent it by um, the chief executive of Sheston Schools. Um, quick, quick guess, can anyone guess what it is? Does anyone know what it is? It's sausages and mash. Who knew that sausage and mash needed um, sugar, dry glucose syrup, liquid butter, not butter, just liquid butter, which is made of rapeseed oil, palm oil, salt, emulsifier. It's got those emulsifiers. In fact, palm oil turns up three times in this list of ingredients, along with all the E numbers. Anyone can tell you that it's not going to make you healthy. That was found in a private ward of a hospital where we're supposed to get better, not where we're supposed to be made more sick. Um, so let's talk about health. So ultra-processed foods are now linked not just to type 2 diabetes, but to dementia. Like, we've read so much about the huge rise in dementia. It's linked to how we eat. Uh, it's linked to inflammatory bowel disease, um, cancers. But let, just to focus on type 2 diabetes, the cost of treating type 2 diabetes by 2035 will outweigh the cost of treating all cancers. So we talk about saving the NHS. Well, we don't talk about it. Rishi talks about it. Um, and he talks about long-term sickness, too. He talks about the economy. Governments talk a lot about the economy and the NHS. But actually, what we eat is driving the destruction of both the economy and the NHS, because the biggest driver of long-term sickness, which is the biggest lag on our economy, if you listen to the economists, is, is um, diet-related disease and type 2 diabetes is bringing the NHS to its knees. So it's all linked, uh, although the government doesn't seem to see that very equally, uh, very, very um, com comprehensively. Um, and then just on inequality, which a few people talked about this morning, um, the top 100 food and energy companies last year, 95% of them more than doubled their profits, and collectively they made 250 billion pounds a year. So that is in a backdrop where this country saw an, an increase in poverty. In fact, every other country, if you listen to the chief executive of Oxfam, saw an increase of poverty. So this inequality of how we're making food and, and across other sectors is something we really have to take on board um, if we're going to address things and change things. Um, and then, and, and one of the drivers of, of those profits in the food companies are the manufacturing 
of these ultra-processed foods, which are really, really high on profit. You know, they make a lot of money. Um, there's a lot of, um, a lot of them are made with the kind of byproducts of um, industrial farming, uh, long shelf lives, um, and people spend a lot of money on marketing to our children, uh, and sadly, with great effect on all of us. Um, so what does a healthy food system look like? Well, maybe it's one that actually starts embracing food that's grown with nature rather than against it and starting to bring in those local foods, which we've seen today and also last night, where we also had a really delicious dinner. Um, a healthy food system makes the most of food, so it doesn't throw a third of it away. When you think that it's contributing to a third of our global emissions and then we're throwing a third of it away, it's nuts. We've got to address these things. Um, and then it's got to embed the designing and marketing of healthy foods. South Korea did this really interestingly. They discovered that their population was getting unhealthy and the government put a lot of money into the marketing of making vegetables sexy, which is kind of a uh, misnomer here in, in, in this kind of um, nation we live in. But, but that it really works. And actually, if anyone can go to, has been to South Korea, has anyone been to South Korea here? I mean, the food's amazing, right? And, and sexy, I would argue. I mean, I love kimchi in a cheese toasty, definitely. Um, they've done really well, and they've got one of the healthy, healthiest populations. Um, I do have an issue with healthy as a word, because it's not sexy. And food should be delicious, first, first of all, but it should also do us good, and it is possible to do both. Um, and I think a healthy food system also has to inv invest in research and innovation. So bring back to my story about Oaxaca, we set up initially because there was basically no Mexican food in this country, and um, so it was a gap in the market, and greedily I also wanted to eat tacos after I'd come back from Mexico where I lived for a year, and I couldn't find them anywhere. Uh, and I really wanted to tell people that Tex-Mex was not Mexico. And, and Mexico is more of this wonderful, colourful country that I kind of had come to love so much. Um, but one of the ways I had to talk to people about what Mexican food was, was to try and get them out of this Tex-Mex kind of lie that they'd been fed for so, many, um, for so many years. I had to start talking about the ingredients, about 100 varieties of corn, whether they're red or black or white or multicoloured, 200 varieties of chilies not there to burn your tongue off, but there for flavour, cacao, tomatoes, beans, avocados. I mean, I could go on peanuts, turkey, wild herbs, um, wild, wild greens, this is an amazing country in terms of ingredients. In fact, it's mega biodiverse. That is actually a technical term that I learned from a wonderful scientist at Kew. Uh, they have about 50,000 flowering plant species compared to our 1,500. And I'm a real advocate of local food. I love all varieties of apples. I think we have incredible fruit and vegetables. And then I learned this, which really blew my mind. I was like, okay, we're not doing so well compared to... But if we can keep the ones we're growing, that would be good. Um, and then even the system of farming in Mexico was one of the things I loved. It's a companion crop system, um, farming or, or sister farming. So the corn provides a structure for the bean plant to grow up, the beans fix the nitrogen in the soil, the corn has this wonderful kind of leaf system that creates um, a system of moisture on the ground and, and prickly leaves that stop insects crawling up. And with this type of complex farming system, you do not need chemicals to grow successful crops. And I think regenerative farmers are increasingly seeing that a diverse planting system is really helping them not need herbicides, pesticides, and the fungicides that are ruining our waterways, killing biodiversity, and also making us really ill. Um, so we set up, we were doing something different, but we had sustainability baked into our DNA from the beginning. Uh, we were a founding member of the SRA, and we did things like recycle our food waste from the word go, um, because it was just something that we kind of believed in. It was 2007, so we didn't necessarily talk about it much, because it, it wasn't that cool to be sustainable in 2007, and you didn't really want to be known as a kind of hippie sandal wearer, although these days wearing socks and sandals is actually very cool as well. So, you know, things do change. Um, so we baked into our system. We talked, we actually talked to our staff all the time about carbon, about um, recycling. Um, I would always talk to my kitchen team about um, not mixing up the waste systems, about whether their grandmother was watching them when they served a plate of food. We had amazing systems where we took the hot air from our fridges and freezers to, to heat our hot water taps, um, and, and all sorts of things. And by 2016, we were carbon um, neutral. 
in fact, and had this zero waste to landfill, um, which was great. Um, and in fact, in 2015, I did a project with Tristan Stewart about food waste, which I still, I cannot believe we're not doing, because I think it's great to compost our food waste, but by far the most efficient use for food waste, if you're going to waste it, upstream you should try and not waste it and divert it and give it to people in need. But if it's got to the stage where it needs to be wasted, you should be cooking it to get rid of any bacteria and then feeding it back to livestock. And we're still not doing it after the foot and mouth um, epidemic, um, which interestingly, if you believe some scientists, was linked back to the illegal importation of foot and mouth uh, contaminated meat from South Africa, it wasn't linked to bad practice in Cumbria. In any case, you, if you centralised the system and made it safe, which is perfectly possible, you could be saving a lot of carbon by feeding our food waste back to livestock. And I really hope we can keep that on the agenda. Um, another thing we did is start measuring our carbon impact. Um, especially when um, the government told us we had to publish calories on our menu, which I fundamentally think is a really blunt instrument and tells you nothing about a dish. You know, a calorie can tell you... I mean, calories are essentially good. Like, we need calories in, that, in order to get out of bed in the morning. And, you know, I cycle to, to have the energy to just, you know, dance and have fun. We need, we need calories, so that's a good thing. Uh, whether they're good for you or not is another thing. And um, a carbon, uh, a calorie count on a menu doesn't tell you anything about whether they're good calories or bad calories. Um, but anyway, we had to do that, so we decided to put carbon on the menu at the same time. Um, we also have always had this strong emphasis on vegetables on our menu. 35% of our menu was vegetarian when we opened. It's now 50%. And for me, that was always actually affordability for, foremost. So when we opened, we had organic meat on our menus, but I wanted people to access us on all levels of income. So for me, it was really important to have lots of choice in, in vegetarian food. Of course, the price of vegetables has gone up, and, and, and often in times now, um, you know, vegetable dishes can actually be really prep heavy and expensive for a restaurant, but it's still a really good option, particularly if we're going to start eating within our planetary budget. We do need to eat more vegetables um, and then source better meat. Um, but all of this does point to a bit of carbon tunnel vision, and when all other businesses started becoming carbon neutral. My business partner, who is competitive, which is why we've been so successful, started thinking, right, well, we've got to go to net zero. If everyone's doing that, you know, carbon neutral, now we've got to go to net zero because we've still got to be ahead of the curve. So we started exploring what net zero looked like, which is basically scope three, so it includes all your food. So scope one and two, which is carbon neutral, doesn't allow for the food in your supply chain. So that's much harder for a food business, but perfectly possible. But meantime, I was looking at all the carbon trading um, and tokens we'd been buying over the time and seeing how the price of the same carbon tokens was going up and wondering where that money was going, like what middlemen were taking the profit of these carbon tokens that we're trading. And wouldn't it be better to spend that money on our actual food system and the power of our purchasing rather than just offsetting? And because also carbon, which is very important, but it doesn't take into account um, inequality of food systems, um, biodiversity loss, uh, soil degradation, and all those other aspects that we have to look at if we're looking at uh, the future of the planet. Um, so we started working with, in fact, we always did, but we increasingly started working with more people from Riverford Organic, Hodmodoz, who are a fantastic company that grow pulses in a very regenerative way, um, and really using our supply chain to get better ingredients on our menu, uh, paying more for them. I mean, our meat is all free range. We pay a massive premium for that, and probably if we were publicly owned, we wouldn't be allowed to do that, but because we're privately owned, we can. Um, but then also in terms of innovation, um, we looked at our avocado basket, which was vast. We sell a lot of guacamole in our restaurants. Uh, and we started thinking, well, could we come up with a, a different type of guacamole, one that didn't have avocados but was made from pulses? And this was actually, the idea was, um, was actually ceded to us from people in Mexico who could no longer afford to eat avocados themselves, even though it was their local fruit, because of global demand for this, for this fruit. Um, we got a lot of coverage, by the way, and I think, you know, we talked about greenwashing, but if you are actually doing something with your business that is very kind of true to what you're doing and, and real, you do get amazing coverage. We equally got a huge amount of coverage recently when we took our steak tackle off the menu. Now, it was really badly reported on 
basically a lot of people were saying, oh, we're taking beef off our menu. We weren't taking beef off our menu. What we're taking off was our skirt steak because the skirt of a cattle is about three kilogram of a 200 kilo carcass. What we want to do is take half of an animal, slow cook it, and then put it on the grill with grilled cheese, delicious salsa. I tell you, the taco is delicious. Um, but by that way, we can, we can purchase way fewer animals and know that we're buying them from particular farms that are absolutely farm with nature and doing great, great jobs for biodiversity. So it was all about putting where our money, where our mouths were, and getting that like pull power through our supply chain. Um, the challenges, I've really, I've no idea how I've been going on for, but you must give me two more minutes. Okay, so I've got two more minutes. It's really hard knowing what slides to keep in. So obviously there is cost. You've got to know what you're talking about. It's got to be authentic. But I think it really does help you recruit talent. Our staff really believe in, in working for us. And I think across the board, whether you're a huge company or a smaller one, increasingly young people want to go and work for companies that are doing the right thing. And I think that will be a driving force of where top talent go. Um, this is a, sl a slide of a farm that um, Andy Cato um, lived near um, in the southwest of France, where there was absolutely no soil left. So that was, that was the impact of um, extreme farming. And this was the soil he inherited from the farm he bought in the southwest of France. After five years of farming regeneratively, he managed to transform that completely dead soil into a, a, a network of, of plant species that allowed him to farm incredible wheat. Um, I do think there's a case for regulation. If you look at that marketing and advertising power of big business, it's absolutely vast. The idea that we have um, a kind of choice over what we eat is frankly ludicrous. The whole system is stacked against us. It's stacked against business as well, because unless we have regulation, if you're the CEO of one food company, like the chief executive of Danone, and you stand up for what you believe, you can then just get sacked by your shareholders. So we do need government to make regulation. Uh, we need the power of business at the same time, though, because you can have lead, you know, steel market share by what you're doing. There's a massive role of public procurement, and we are um, DEFRA is talking to the soil station a lot about this. We spend £4 billion a year on the food in schools, hospitals, prisons, social care. And in fact, I'm going to run out of time to show you more slides, but Chefs and Schools is a charity I helped set up five years ago where we are putting trained chefs into school kitchens and transforming the way children eat. We're doing it at a lower food cost. So I was nearly on the Today programme this morning to talk about um, food inflation. One of the things you can do if you've got a skilled workforce, particularly cooks, is you can be nimble and cook with cheap ingredients and you can still cook really healthy food. And I really think there's a role for that. But until we have an independent body in government, we cannot make proper change. Food is, a, is in every sector of the government. It's in farming, it's in business, uh, it's in health. And the government will keep on passing the buck if it's not addressed in an independent board, like the Independent Climate Committee. We need to have an independent board that is cross-party to really make change and, and, and kind of kick these MPs up their asses because they are so slow to make change. It is a joke. Um, and then just briefly, I know that Glasgow is a circular city. 80% of all the food we eat by 2050 will be in, in cities. So there's a massive case for making positive change in every building development. In Labrick Grove in London near me, they're about to use a massive building development. And I'm going to be one of those rabble raisers who's saying, what are you doing about a green city? Where are your waste systems? What are you building in to this building system that's allowing for biodiversity, nature, and um, you know, avoiding that waste stream um, that system that we've got baked into our current lateral kind of extractative system of producing food. And then just very briefly, peri-urban areas have this huge potential to feed cities. So local food is important and it is possible. Um, and it's worth a massive amount of money as well. So we, let's, not be, let's not be shy about going after the money because you can be green and, and make money at the same time. So thank you very much. <laughs> I'm so glad we did this after lunch and not before Thomasina, because otherwise that was going to be very challenging. But you took us through a whole systemic approach to food, health, planetary health, the amazing inspiring story of Oaxaca and how you, uh, and how you developed that. But then you took us back to, to cities, to people, to schools, to children's health and everything else. We're so grateful. We're going to bring John onto the stage to join us. Would you like to sit down or would yeah. you be happy to stand up? I, like to sit 